Hello, my dudes. Today, I want to talk about the concept of peaking in high school. It's a common insult, a roast that's meant to punch up at those who used to be on top. I've been thinking about this for a while, honestly, since high school. You know, the ways that it comes up in the media and in real life. So let me paint a picture with a very stereotypical narrative, like the type you'd see in an 80s or 90s teen movie. There is no nuance here. Everyone can be neatly divided into cliques. First, you have those who ruled the school, the cheerleaders, the jocks, the prom royalty. They were extremely popular and won every contest, but they were also vicious bullies, especially toward the nerds and outcasts. What are you looking at, nerd? So the popular kids have a glorious time in high school. But after that, it's all downhill. They often end up staying in their hometown, marrying each other and having kids young, working dead-end jobs or shilling MLM products on Facebook. And because their lives suck now, they just can't stop talking about their former glory days, even when it's been years or decades. Sad. Meanwhile, the 99%, the unpopular average folks, we might have been late bloomers, but we actually end up pretty cool and successful. And you know who's gonna end up the richest in our class? The biggest geek. It's Revenge of the Nerds. To witness the downfall of the popular bullies is pure schadenfreude. It's karma, and it is extremely satisfying. So, even though the media depictions of this dynamic tend to be super stereotypical, like that, these concepts do ring true to a lot of people. Like, be honest, would you find it a little bit satisfying to imagine or discover that you're doing way better than your bully? This HuffPost contributor wrote about her Mean Girl story 50 years later. For some of the haughtiest junior high mean queens, it's been all downhill since then. Not for me. I learned that I am much more accomplished in life with multiple advanced degrees and a rewarding career. Both of these mean girls also never had the greatest and most rewarding gift in life, in my opinion, as neither bore or adopted any children. One never even ventured away from our original neighborhood, now in an appalling state of decline. Lady! Who's sounding like a mean girl now? And hey, I am all for being proud of yourself and how far you've come, but maybe you don't have to be a dick about other people's life circumstances. But this comes up so often, this idea of wishing karmic misfortune upon anyone who ever hurt you, or even just those you might've been envious of because they were having a good time and maybe you weren't. I'm never gonna tell you how to process your own emotions or bad memories. And I know it is not always as simple as forgive and forget, but I do think we should absolutely listen to ourselves. When we rejoice in someone's downfall, especially in the ways I'm gonna discuss throughout this video, just be aware that we might also be promoting shitty worldviews. We might actually be reinforcing the painful, restrictive hierarchies that hurt us in the first place. All the people in high school that were popular are now losers. All those people that you, you know, fantasized over, wanted to be like, or even be in their group. Newsflash, bro, we're all losers. Everybody's a loser. When you graduate fucking high school, what that whole hierarchy social life fucking bullshit it doesn't matter anymore i loved that response and i think it's very healthy for us all to just accept that we're losers and being a loser is fine Perhaps loserdom is the human condition. But really, high school is this strange universe that places us in the confines of this really vicious teenage hierarchy. And once we leave school, we're faced with the real world. Of course, social hierarchies absolutely still exist, but at least we're not stuck on campus anymore. You know, we can at least try to resist some of the bullshit. It's time to go live, grow, become your own person. You don't have to think about high school or your old classmates ever again. That is until one day you get an invitation to a class reunion. It's been 10 years already. Who's gonna be there? I wonder if my old crush is still cute. It could be fun. It could be horrible. In an instant, that whole can of worms can be opened right back up. But before we get into all of that, this portion of today's video is sponsored by Parade. I can't be the only one who has had an irrational fear of underwear lines, right? Panty lines, dare I say? So I have long been very pro thong. I love a thong and I'm still a fan if they're comfy. But in recent years, I finally started to try other cuts of underwear. So today I wanna give a special shout out to this particular pair. This is a high rise cheeky. It's in the fabric silky mesh. True to its name, it is silky. It is soft and smooth. This pair is actually from a Ghani collab, so it has this very cute embroidery on the back. And this pattern is called Lily Pad. It is so gorgeous. But I've been so delighted to find out that I can wear a cheeky pair like this and still 
be fine in jeans, no bunching, no riding up, no unsightly lines in sight. And also I must say, visible underwear lines are really not the end of the world anyway. But I know that depending on your outfit or what you're wearing, it might make you feel a little more comfortable if things are a little more sleek. Anyway, there are many reasons why Parade is my favorite underwear brand. I love the fun, playful styles, plus the quality. I'm pretty sure I still have every pair I've ever bought from them because they just hold up so well. So if you are shopping for bras or underwear anytime soon, check out Parade. Use my code FERG40 to get 40% off site-wide. And beware, a lot of these colors and styles are limited, so they may sell out fast. Class reunions force us to face the past or just decline the invite. Most people feel very strongly at just the thought of attending a class reunion. Scared? Disgusted? Excited? Nervous? There are people you'd love to see and others maybe you'd like to never see again. So much inner conflict. You know what, I'm just not gonna go. But what about the FOMO? What if everyone else goes and has a wonderful time and you miss out? No, 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 no. It's probably just gonna be dumb. It's gonna be honestly all the people who peaked in high school. Of course they wanna relive the old days. It's gonna be them and then anyone who like had a big glow up and just wants to come show off. Like how has a decade passed already? What have I been doing with my life? 10 years, man! 10! Where have you been for 10 years? I freaked out, joined the army, went into business for myself. I'm a professional killer. On one hand, a lot has changed since we were 17, 18, but this still feels too soon somehow. We're not even 30 yet. Like when you watch movies about high school reunions, it just seems like they're for old people. Maybe that's because all the actors were a lot older than they were playing, but still, it feels like we should all have houses and partners and impressive careers. And especially in this economic period, as we talk about all the time, where a lot of us millennials and Gen Z aren't necessarily reaching those expected milestones or it's taking us a lot longer. It can weigh very heavily on where we think we should be at this point. Overall, I think this kind of nostalgia, looking back on high school and everything you've done since, can trigger a bit of an existential crisis. There are so many paths you could have taken, so many what ifs in your life. Who you were, who you are now, the whole idea of like potential. So now I just wanna be a little more casual, a little more chatty. Again, when I was thinking about this topic, it started with the idea of peaking in high school, haha, <laughs> just laughing at the people that, you know, go back to visit the school the year after they've graduated. <laughs> hey guys, oh my God. <laughs> This is so weird. <laughs> I feel like naked without my backpack. This is so funny. What? What do you mean? What am I doing here? Or they keep coming to the football games. It's like, dude, you were on the team five years ago. Hey, man, I really used to run this school, but I don't know. Things are just so different now. You know that I was homecoming thing? Everybody loved me here. Everybody. But again, I do think it's bigger than that. And I think us wondering about who peaked in high school or whether we peaked in high school, again, it's all rooted in this comparison and this self-consciousness. And I think this whole process is best described in the 1997 cult classic, Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion. So in this movie, you have Romy and Michelle they left their hometown of Tucson, Arizona, and they've gone to LA to pursue their dreams. And at the time, before they think about the reunion, they're enjoying life, you know? There are some things they still want, but they're having a good time. But as soon as this reunion and the idea of seeing their old classmates is introduced, suddenly they feel a little inadequate. Well, then what's the point of going if we're not going to impress people? These are kind of really classic fears of not being accomplished enough or not being in the right place in life. The main things that that they uh, feel self-conscious about are not having boyfriends <laughs> and their jobs. Romy is a cashier and Michelle is unemployed. They're also very concerned with being thinner which is one part classic like 90s, early 2000s body image stuff. But also, yeah, a lot of people struggle with body image, especially in being physically in the same room with people who used to know you 10 years ago. So Romy and Michelle make a plan. They are going to dress up like business women. They're going to give that appearance and maybe they can pull it off. Do you have some sort of businesswoman special? Come again? Well, we're business women. Yeah, from LA. Eventually on their journey, their road trip out to Tucson, they decide they can claim they invented 
post-its. So spoilers ahead. <laughs> they get to the reunion and there's an entire like dream sequence, alternate version of reality. But I'm going to skip over that because I prefer the real version. One major conflict is them seeing the A group who were the popular mean girls. Most of them are still friends, still in a group. And yes, they're still mean. Now, one interesting question of this movie is, did the popular mean girls also peak in high school. The, the main mean girl of the A group, Christy, she initially wanted to be an anchor woman. In reality, she's a mom, she's pregnant. The whole group is pregnant at the same time, classic. But she is married to Billy, like the cute guy in school, who was also Michelle's crush, classic. <laughs> but this does hit the mark of, you stayed in your hometown, you married your high school sweetheart, you had kids early-ish. Anyway, Romy tries to share her story of inventing post-its. I invented post-its. <laughs> It all falls apart and the mean girls mock her so <laughs> cruelly. They end up like announcing it to the entire reunion. That was not necessary. Mean girls will mean girl. But this is a good transformative moment because Romy and Michelle decide, no, we should be ourselves. They change into these very iconic outfits that they've like designed and made. And they have the most satisfying bully confrontation scene. I love it. What the hell is your problem, Christy? Why are you always such a nasty bitch? You get some kind of sick pleasure from torturing other people? So Michelle and I did make up some lame story. We only did it because we wanted you to treat us like human beings. But you know what I finally realized? I don't care if you like us, because we don't like you. You're a bad person with an ugly heart, and we don't give a flying fuck what you think. Christy tries to make fun of their clothes as she did in high school. They're as deluded about their lives as they are about those hideous clothes. But there was one A group girl who even back then found them interesting. They made them in home ec from their own patterns. Actually, I think they're semi-interesting. Now she works for Vogue and she comes in and says, actually, actually, Christy, they've got nice lines, a fun, frisky use of color. All in all, I'd have to say they're really not bad. It's delicious. Then there's a little bit about like perception. And I think this is an important theme when we think about peaking in high school or the idea of going to a reunion, how you perceive yourself, how you used to perceive yourself versus how you are perceived by other people. We are famously bad at understanding how we're perceived by others. It, there tends to be a bit of a mismatch, especially in high school. That can be for better or for worse. But I also love this subplot about Heather. And the whole time you were making my life hell. The A group was making your life hell. I didn't know. I bet in high school, everybody made somebody's life hell. Mm -mm, not me. Never had the opportunity to make anyone's life hell. You know what? I bet that's not true. You were really unpleasant. You think? Oh. Yeah. And then you see the girl that she's been mean to the whole time who confirms that she did in fact make her life hell, which is very satisfying to Heather. <laughs> very validating. Please don't tell me to fuck off because it really hurts my feelings. I hurt your feelings. Yeah, all the time. Tremendous. That's tremendous. Go get your stupid yearbook. I would be happy to sign it. I think the character of Heather is just hilarious, first of all. But I also think that this nuance is important because again, writing this video has made me think a lot about bullies and mean girls. And I do think mean girls, like, lowercase mean girls would be a really fascinating topic to dive into because there's a lot of conversation lately about like former mean girls, confessions of people who have changed. And again, our perceptions of like who was a mean girl in our own lives, or maybe if we were mean girls, maybe we were mean girls and didn't even know it. I think having a bit of nuance and acknowledging that first of all, teenagers tend to be assholes. They're not known for being their most compassionate, consider selves. You know, we still we still have time for our brains to evolve after high school. And that's not to say everyone was like a bully, but I think if you honestly look back, yeah, you probably had some conflict. You probably had someone that you hurt at some time during school, intentionally or unintentionally, again, to very varying <laughs> degrees. Uh, but again, I think that topic would be really interesting, trying to dissect the mean girl. Anyway, finally, we get to the climax of the conclusion and the old nerd Sand Andy shows up and guess what? Revenge of the nerds. He is in fact the richest and most successful person from school. It's so over the top, but so good. And he's still in love with Michelle. So you must be like the most successful person in our entire graduating class. Well, I guess that depends on how you define success. If to you success means having a house in Aspen, one in Acapulco, 
penthouse in New York, mansion in Malibu, a 60-foot yacht, an eight-seed Windstar, a Bell Jet Ranger, a Bentley, a personal trainer, a full-time chef, a living masseuse, and a staff of 24, then yeah, <laughs> I guess I am successful. I thought this point about how you define success was interesting, um, but obviously he's defining it in the traditional like wealth and impressive career kind of success. But I think that's a question that's also an important factor. Like, how do you define success? It can mean very different things to different people, but that can be hard to, again, get into the nuance of when you're having these little catch-up chats at a reunion. Then there's this fantastic dance scene, one of my favorites. Overall, a very satisfying watch. And again, I just loved that Obviously this movie featured a lot of those tropes that I was looking for, but I do think it also has some of those true to real life questions and feelings that we may go through when reuniting with old peers. So let's rewind and go back to the idea of high school reunions in general. I will say, first of all, high school reunions class reunions have definitely changed and evolved, like the necessity of them has changed, especially since social media. Back in the day, many decades ago, like it was very possible to literally lose touch with people. You had no idea what anyone was up to, where they were. And so the idea of coming back together in one physical space was perhaps more enticing. There was a lot more mystery, a lot more intrigue. But with the advent of social media, it's so common for many of us to at least still be Facebook friends or following each other on Instagram or even LinkedIn. My God, you know what people have been up to. All of this has kind of lessened the need for and reduced the impact of class reunions. Jennifer Sr. wrote, whether it's for vindication or validation, whether out of self-punishment or self-appeasement, many of us choose to devote a lot of time revisiting our high school years. Before Facebook, there was a real discontinuity between our high school selves and the rest of our lives. Social ties that would have gone dormant now remain accessible over time and all the time. So I do think that is one very valid factor in affecting whether you feel compelled to go to a class reunion or not. We don't really need to reconnect if we never actually lost touch. So now I wanna rewind again, back to kind of the tropes about those who peaked in high school, because I wanna dig in a little bit deeper. As I mentioned in the beginning, I think that sometimes the ways that we dig at people who peaked in high school or people who hurt us can be a bit of a harmful, shitty response. And as much as we think it's like dunking on them, it's really just like buying into some classist and otherwise shitty beliefs, you know? So let's talk about like some of these tropes or common ideas. I tried to look up on like Reddit, where did the popular kids end up? Or where did your high school bully end up? Here's one comment. My high school reunion very much cemented in my mind that the popular crowd were the ones who peaked in high school. None of them left town, they all married each other, and they are all still friends, acting like they were still the popular kids, despite the balding heads and flabby waistlines. None of them ever moved on in life and were more than happy to live a perpetual high school existence of mediocrity. I'm like, Jesus. There's definitely a sense of bitterness in a lot of these these responses. And I feel like, again, I don't know you, I'm not your therapist, but I feel to these sorts of people responding on Reddit anonymously, maybe these are some things you need to work through. And also again, reassess your, your insults, making fun of people for balding or gaining weight. Not very cool. Another comment says, yeah, it was a lot more fun to attend reunions and maybe not recognize certain people due to weight gain or general ugliness slash aging. Now you can see the train wreck happen in real time online. Again, yikes. This is why I think the nuance of like bullying or who is mean, I think bullying does have a power dynamic, but you can certainly still be a mean person aside from the power dynamic, whatever, future video. <laughs> but again, as those comments and my beginning little spiel said, the satisfying downfall of a bully often involves these certain traits. One, staying in or moving back to your hometown, marrying or having kids young, being broke or working a dead end job and aging like milk. This scene in 13 Going on 30, where Jenna gets in a cab and her former crush, Chris Grandy, is the driver, it hits a lot of these classic points. Jenna Rink. Yeah? Chris Grandy. <laughs> so, so what are you doing? Are you, are you married? Because if you're single, I definitely want a number. We could get together, you know? I'm still living at home. Well, that's still- Come on, Grandy. He's working what is presented as an unimpressive job, check. Still living at home, check. He references when they used to date and assumes that she would still want his number. Living in the past, check. And yes, he's presented as 
looking unattractive or not looking like he did when he was younger. We see this trope all the time. Another example that I can think of is Johnny Lawrence, the villain from the Karate Kid movies. I love the show Cobra Kai. It's kind of a guilty pleasure of mine. It is just, it is wild. (laughs) But in Cobra Kai, Johnny Lawrence, who formerly was a rich kid, like he had rich a rich stepdad, I think. He ends up a broke loser. He's unemployed, he's an alcoholic. And again, all of those components paint the picture of loser who peaked in high school. So let me talk through these one by one. Dig in a little bit. Staying in your hometown. This idea, of course, is meant to signify small town close-mindedness or you're unambitious. You had no desire to leave and do anything else, you know? Everyone with big dreams moves to the big city. Though, in reality, of course, there are many reasons that people either can't leave their hometown or end up moving back. I totally support leaving a place that is unsafe for you or doesn't match your values, but I do think there is some, definitely some shittiness. There's a, there's a, I just, this whole video. There's a shitty undercurrent in our discourse often about rural places, small towns, even the South. A lot of that is often just rooted in classism and racism. So I think we have to be very careful in what we're critiquing about certain places and not just generalizing entire populations as like irredeemable based on where they live. And two, marrying and or having kids young. There's a lot to say about this, so I'm not gonna get in too deep, but in the US at least, especially in smaller towns, this is typically related to Christianity and political conservatism, family values. So especially depending on your political leanings, you may immediately see these things as kind of red flags, perhaps the sort of people that you do not align yourself with or the sort of values that you believe in. But in terms of the media depictions of the people who peaked in high school who are marrying and having kids young, the ex-populars, this situation often does not turn out well. Like in Romeo and Michelle, the bullies say, at least we're happily married. You're just jealous because unlike a certain ball busting dried up career woman I might mention, we're all happily married. That's right, Christy. Keep telling yourself that. And it's just such a like, Such a subtle dig, but it's so effective. Again, in this trope, maybe they're in a terrible marriage or they're divorced or a single parent and it's a struggle. And this is played for laughs because it's kind of like they thought they accomplished the hetero American dream. And sometimes they think they're better than everyone else because they hit those goals so early. They like bragged about, I got married, I married Billy and we had kids, but now they're miserable. So again, karma. Though obviously in reality, I don't think anyone should be made fun of for this. It is horrible to be stuck in a relationship or a situation that is dysfunctional or abusive or painful. And I'm obviously critical of the culture that encourages young people, especially young women, to get sucked into this kind of trad wife trap. Trad wife adjacent or the pipeline to trad trad wifery. Number three, you are broke or working a dead end job. This is a big one. This is a very big one. As I mentioned before, Chris Grandy's a taxi driver. Oh no. Johnny Lawrence, again, I think in the beginning of Cobra Kai, he's unemployed, but he's broke. He's living in a shitty apartment. Ha ha. This is a common one um, that people rejoice in when gleefully discovering that their old bully is not doing well. Like on Reddit, this commenter said, my ex bully's card was declined at the grocery store and I paid for her stuff. She wanted to die of humiliation. It was glorious. And a reply says, karma is beautiful. And I'm just like, oh, that's fucked up. But again, a lot of people do find that kind of situation satisfying. Like karma keeps coming up. But the implication again, that this sort of misfortune is karma is not a cool idea to promote. Like again, it ties into like meritocracy or like, this is not a word, but like (laughs) karmaocracy. The idea that people who are good and work hard are the most successful and the people who are shitty people end up having shitty lives because they deserve it. It's like, clearly that's not true. Many wonderful, hardworking people are struggling. They are in poverty. And it's just shitty to imply that there is that um direct relationship plus honestly more often it is the opposite the mean popular kids tend to be privileged they grow up rich and they stay rich and then the idea of working a dead-end job being this humiliating thing yeah that popular guy now he works at autozone he's a manager at autozone what the fuck is wrong with that 
How is that a bro- how is that being a loser? Again, I think that was a really good response. What is wrong with that? Oh, you're a manager at a store? You're working some job in your hometown? What is wrong What is wrong with that? Spell it out to me. Cuz in having your little haha laughing at this person and where they ended up, you're revealing a lot about yourself and maybe your own biases. Biases? And fourth, aging like milk. This of course ties back to the idea that typically those who are the most popular, the prom royalty, they tend to be good looking and fit. And there's a lot to say about um, how we as society look at high schoolers and perhaps sexualize high schoolers. Like the fact that we consider 17 to be the prime of like young girls, gross. There's a lot I could say about that. But yes, it's no surprise that typically popular kids do get a lot of their social clout from their appearance. So the idea that the previously good looking popular people age badly is supposed to be satisfying. The bullies ending up ugly, bald, and or fat is almost always featured in some way. And I don't have to spell out why this is shitty. Obviously it reinforces the idea that social value should be tied to appearance. That's valid. Yeah, let's be fat phobic promoting a shitty hierarchy that that harms everyone. But we can't make an exception just because it's targeted at somebody you didn't like, you know? Okay, so final thoughts. First of all, we are not living in a, an 80s or 90s teen movie. <laughs> People are in fact more complex than these stock characters or these tropes. And there's a lot of nuance that I wanted to add earlier, but I didn't want to let it get too wordy. So like, again, in the media, we typically see the popular kids are the bullies. They're often the same groups, but bullies can be unpopular or popular kids can actually be nice and cool. Like that's why they're well liked. Again, any, any iteration of this can be possible. The second thing I wanted to say was that again, all of these karmic consequences either assume that because a person was mean or shitty in high school, they deserve to have a horrible life from now on. And also it assumes that people don't or can't change and that they can't become better. If you were shitty at any point in your teen years, you deserve a life of hell in perpetuity. Like in reality, a lot of people have a tough time through high school, even the people who, according to everyone else, are the popular well-liked people. Like again, we never know what's going on in people's home lives or popular on popular bullying. There are so many dynamics, but I think we can all agree like high school is pretty hellish for a lot of people. And we are probably not at our best and most developed in high school in terms of our social abilities, our emotional intelligence. And most of us do change quite a lot after high school as we continue to live and grow. So yeah, here we are. I hope you enjoyed this one. Just a couple of things that have been floating around my mind lately. Please let me know if you've ever attended a class reunion, if you would, if you wouldn't. And thank you again to Parade for sponsoring today's video. Use my code FERG40 to get 40% off site wide. All right, that is all. Thank you so much for watching. I feel like I'm recording like an episode of School News. Hey Broncos, thank you so much. Oh, just get out there and We'll see you tomorrow for more announcements. The bit's not working. Okay, thanks, bye.